Octopath Traveler is good and precious and right, and if you don't like it, your head is going to split open with the skull falling out like the dog in the thing. So Octopath Traveler has been on my radar for a long, long time, long before it came out. I was anticipating it, expecting it. I try not to engage in what some of you may call hype because, well, as one example, people believed the hype about the first Titanfall and we all saw how that turned out. But nonetheless, the prospect of a proper old-fashioned Japanese RPG on the Nintendo Switch was too good too good a prospect to ignore and to not get at least a little bit giddy about. Having spent my time since launch hooked to the game, I am pleased to tell you that it really is all that. Unapologetic about its inspirations and really not doing much to advance the genre, it's just doing what's already been done in a really good way. And that's all that matters. Is it good? Yes it is! And that's the important thing. As the name suggests, Octopath Traveler is a game about eight distinct stories featuring eight distinct characters. You have Primrose the Dancer, Ulberic the Warrior, Cyrus the Scholar, Tressa the Merchant, Therion the Thief, Ophelia the Cleric, Alfin the Alchemist, and Hunnit the Hunter, whose use of oldie worldy English is so obscene. Yoren won't and believeth it. The game's world is set out in a somewhat straightforward sprawl. The beginning towns where the characters start their stories are drawn more towards the centre of the world and spread out from there as you travel throughout the world, you find new towns with new characters in them, and once you've collected the full party, or you can just ignore certain characters if you want, you initiate later chapters by travelling further out in something of a loose radius. Every character's story is unique to them, so unique in fact that other members of your party don't get involved. When you enter a town with story content for a given character and said character is in your party, you get the choice to kick off that story and only the character to which the story pertains is involved in the dialogue, the characters, the going off to the dungeon to fight the monsters and the inevitable boss. Pretty much all the stories stick to a straightforward routine in terms of gameplay progress. When it comes to story dialogue, all of the other characters who aren't involved go away, so you're just dealing with one protagonist on their own. Then if a fight kicks up, the other three party members burst out of nowhere, essentially just playing fighting backup. The only significant interactions between characters occur during what's called travel banter, which you can access as an option after most story sequences. And it'll feature another member of your party commentating on what just occurred to the protagonist of that particular story. The paths these characters go on don't really overlap, and I would have liked to have seen more story crossover potential, or just more party interactions full stop, but I also understand that that would make the game immeasurably more complex and they've opted to keep it simple in terms of what the characters motivations are, why they're teaming up, they're essentially just teaming up for shits and giggles, that's the point of it. There are eight companions who became companions because they just shrugged and thought hell I'll help you out, which is fine for the most part except it does cause some dissonance here and there, there's a bit of a disconnect between certain characters and what they're doing in game, or at least what they're allowing to happen on their watch. Why is the holy gooder than good cleric teaming up with a thief who isn't even a noble thief, he's just a thief and will steal from all of the NPCs in town in front of her, she won't bat an eyelid. The closest you get to an address of this is the aforementioned story banter where one of the more morally upright characters may admonish the morally flexible ones. They'll tart and they'll disapprove but ultimately they won't do anything practical to stop it, making Octopus Traveler a biting satirical teardown of the GOB. Nonetheless, I've played D&D campaigns with flimsier reasons for the characters getting together, so I can overlook it, and the stories themselves are well written and quite well voice acted, I must say. You typically expect JRPGs to have bad voice acting, which is stupid, really, since they rely on story more than a lot of other games and a lot of other genres. The writing balances some whimsy and charm against darker themes. Some of the stories in particular get a little bit of Adult, and I have more than an inkling that the writing team were big fans of Game of Thrones. A lot of world building pays a homage to George R. R. Martin's Westeros, and I have a feeling that Primrose's campaign in particular owes a lot to everybody's favourite novel series about food, fucking and fire breathing dragons. I will say though that while the fully voiced dialogue sequences are quite good, the quasi voiced dialogue sequences leave more to be desired, or rather less to be desired. I don't need a voice sample for every 
single bit of text that isn't fully voiced. But that's what we get, and often what they're saying has nothing to do with what they're saying, or rather what you hear them say, is often notably far removed from what the text is telling you they're actually saying. One of the most glaring examples is where Primrose in-game says, Faith will be your shield, that's the house words of her family. Except the voice sample says, Faith will be my shield. Could they not have changed one or the fucking other so they're the same bloody thing? Or was it the other way round? Did she say, your she or my sh it don't matter, it don't matter. These incongruous voice samples pop up all the time and it's distracting and would have been much better to have just had them make noises or laughs or grunts, stuff like that, or just not do it at all, it wasn't needed. It's just this constant weirdness. Certainly not my a cup of tea, I'll tell you that much for nothing, matey boy. When visiting towns full of NPCs, the characters you have in your party also have what we call path actions, special NPC interactions that are unique to each character. Albert Eric the Warrior, for example, can challenge villagers to a duel in order for a quick bit of experience and gold. And some of these path actions can be used to solve side quests that you'll find dotted around villages. Path actions are split into roguish actions and more morally upright actions. Each path action has an opposite. For example, both the dancer and the cleric can get NPCs to follow them and summon them in a battle. But Primrose seduces them and Ophelia guides them in a holy way. The seduction, the roguish action, has a chance of failure, and if you fail in town four times, then you can't interact with NPCs at all other than to talk to them. A big example of this risk-reward is Therion and Tressa, the thief and the merchant. The thief can steal, but has a chance of failing, whereas the merchant can just buy a character's inventory outright, but they need the gold. It's a fun little system that can add some life to the game, especially the analyze feature, which lets you learn NPC backstories and unlock various discounts and hidden items in town. The only major problem is if you fail four times and are barred from interaction, you have to go to the tavern and pay the barkeep an obnoxious amount of money to restore your reputation. And the only other way to restore a reputation is to beat a chapter. If you're stuck in the middle somewhere, you can only reset the counter by failing the four times and paying the full amount. There's no real way to reset the clock otherwise, which is a bit of a pain in the bloody ass. Onward to the battle system, a traditional turn-based affair. You build a party of four characters out of the eight, and each character has a very distinct battlefield role. The dancer can deal dark elemental damage and also buff up the party. Characters like the thief and the warrior are fairly straightforward. You've got Cyrus who acts as the dark mage, Ophelia, your cleric doing your healing. The less traditional characters have some fairly unique roles on the battlefield. Tressa as a merchant can make money from enemies by pulling coins out their asses and thanking them for the privilege, or spending gold to hire mercenaries that will jump in and do attacks for her. Alfin isn't quite the healer Ophelia is, but as an alchemist he can mix up various potions in the middle of a fight, while the hunter can capture and use enemies like their big ugly Pokemon. Every character is distinctly useful, and there's no party that's really a wrong build as far as I can see though, with the game emphasising area attacks and enemies with a great deal of HP, you want to make sure you've got some offensive capability. Once you get to the Chapter 2 areas, you can unlock secondary jobs which will allow a character to take on the skills of another character. They won't have access to their full range of abilities and benefits, but they will give you access to a lot of their skills, while, more importantly, retaining the skills of their base class to boot, which is really useful because enemies have vulnerable vulnerabilities that you need to manipulate, and if you haven't got the right tools for the job, you're going to have a much harder time. Every enemy, even the most basic grunt, has a shield that will protect them from attack somewhat. It will lower the damage you can do, and the only way you break that shield is to hit them with moves they're vulnerable to. Every enemy is weak to a certain type of weapon, a certain type of spell, just some sort of attack that will lower the value of their shield, a value that can range from one to double digits, and every time you hit an enemy with their vulnerability, that value goes down until the shield breaks. When the shield breaks, the enemy is helpless. It can't attack, it can't 
move, it can't do anything while you're able to wail on it with impunity doing a significant amount of increased damage. You also have to be wary of your boost points. You'll have seen this in other JRPGs before, but you can choose to spend boost points during a turn to increase your damage. If you're attacking with basic weapons, it means you attack more times. If you're using spells, it'll just up their damage output. You can spend up to four boost points a turn to raise the effectiveness of whatever you want to do. And it works for support skills as well, so it's not just damage output. It can increase the likelihood of stealing or collecting money from an enemy, for example. Now, you don't want to always save those boost points. Attacking multiple times can be very useful in hacking down those shields, working those vulnerabilities. So the game becomes a balancing act of when to save, when to spend, when to finally break an enemy. There's a nice layer of strategy as you try to maximize your potential and deal as much damage as possible to foes. And if my advice means anything to you, you will want to maximize your damage output and have at least one area attack skill for every character in your party before long. Mostly because fights can take for bloody ever, so as many advantages as you can stack up beforehand are only a good thing. For time reasons, if nothing else, boss fights especially can go on to the point where you're thinking, bloody hell, how much HP has this thing got? It's like Al Pacino in bloody Scarface. But again, it is good. Very good. Damn bloody really good. And that's the important thing. It's a fantastic turn-based system. Just tactically involving enough to keep jaded JRPG players invested. Tense and challenging at the right times. It's pretty unforgiving. Some of the fights can get rather brutal if you're not prepared. And my god, the fight music. I mean, the soundtrack overall is mwah, perfection. It's great. Some of the best music I've heard in a JRPG in a long, long time. That became something of a lost art. Truly memorable melodies and stuff like that. It's all here. it has been a fairly comprehensive video. Phew. But before we go, we need to talk, of course, about the graphics. Bloody Gorgeous. Blending 16-bit era environments and characters with modern effects, the result is this utterly endearing pop-up book aesthetic. The water effects, the spells and the lighting are just mesmerising. There are a few rare occasions where it gets in the way, sometimes the perspective is off to the point where you can't quite see a set of stairs or you bump into a wall where it looks like you should be able to walk somewhere. But for the most part, nothing this old-fashioned has looked so new and shiny and wondrous. It just looks outstanding. It looks and sounds outstanding, and it plays really, really incredibly bloody great. And that's Octopath Traveler. Bloody gorgeous, bloody good, recommended. Get it up, yeah.